Rob Tabbitt here for Boxing News, joined by Ben Davison. We are in the Ben Davison Performance Centre in Harlow. Ben, always a pleasure to catch up. How are you getting on? Good, thanks, mate. You? Very well, thanks. Very well. Thanks for having me down the gym today. To uh, Pleasure. To admire your work with uh, your growing stable of fighters. Um, yeah, how are you getting on? Good. Um, just working away each day. Working away each day, and we are about a week and a what day is it? Say Thursday, just over a week away from the revenge mission. Lee Wood seeks to reclaim the WBA featherweight title against Mauricio Lara. We're going to start in the first fight mm -hmm. and then talk about the second fight. Um, I feel like now the dust is settled a little bit, and the fact that we've got the rematch a week or so away, people have not say understood, but I think people can now see the value in, in your decision to stop the fight when you stopped it. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, perhaps. I think that, um, I, th I understand immediately people are like, whoa, hold on a minute. But I think afterwards, a lot of people are like, actually, do you know what? I watched it back. Like, I think in the arena, a lot of people were like, what? Like, that was a bit of a hasty decision. But I think a lot of people once watching it back were like, actually, do you know what? I thought you got that right. To be honest with you, like, I'm criticised, heavily criticised a lot. And I think that I actually got more credit and praise for stopping a fight, losing a fight, than I have done ever for, for winning the fight, which is mad. But, um, yeah, obviously gutted to have to make that decision. But um, you have to make that decision and, and off, based off of your instincts and in the moment. And um, that's what I've done there. You mentioned there, like you do get criticism, as we all do. Um, but in the immediate aftermath of that, was there any kind of second where you thought, oh, well, actually, maybe? Or were you always kind of pretty resolute in your decision and you're always confident and you made the right decision? You could, So obviously I had to have a conversation with Lee at, some point about it so all I said to him was I cannot sit here and ever say to you I 100% made the right decision I cannot sit here and say to you I 100% didn't make the right decision unfortunately it was a circumstance that I wasn't willing to take that chance to find out I felt like in that moment so Two of the biggest comebacks in recent times I've been in the corner for. Tyson against Wilder, didn't throw the towel in. And Lee Wood against Mick Conlon, another big one. Big fight, big comeback, didn't throw the towel in. The difference was in those moments and in those fights, I always felt like the fighter was able to defend themselves. And with Lee against Maurizio Lara in the first fight, I wasn't sure of that. I wasn't 100% sure that he could defend himself. Not, can he get through it? He got a chance to defend himself. I, I thought, I don't know if he would react in time. So that was what I based my decision off. And I think that when you look at it like that, and in that sense, I'm comfortable with the decision that I made because, yes, I will never know. But at the same time, we'll never know the other side as well. So um, that was my instincts in that moment. And... You know, the reality is I knew that we had a rematch clause and all these things run through your mind very quickly. But the moment I grabbed the towel, I didn't chuck the towel in straight away. I took as long as I could before the action restarted to assess the situation and I made the decision in that moment. Kind of a final one on kind of the, the stoppage in the first fight. I want to talk about the rematch, of course. I uh, spoke to Lee and Lee said what you've said there. You know, we had the rematch clause and, you know, he's had that fight have continued. I mean, we'll never know, but if he gets brutally knocked out and maybe he's not in a position to box on May the 27th. With that being said, do you stop the fight if there's no rematch clause? Again, so obviously that's something that I've been asked or had to consider going into this fight. You know, two big punches, anything can happen. I think you have to take each situation individually because it would be easy for me, for me now to go chuck the towel in last time got to let this one go got to but you have to take each situation as it comes um, if that situation was to occur so again you can only go off your instincts and assessing the situation as it happened so um, God willing the situation doesn't come about this time and uh Hopefully it's the shoe's on the other foot. But, um, yeah, you just in situations like that, you know, you're fully aware anything can happen in boxing, uh, especially at the highest level. So 
you just have to take each situation as it comes and each fight as it comes and um, go off your instincts in the moment. Based on the performances of each fighter in the first fight and of course going into the second fight, uh, how pleased were you with Lee's performance and, and what did you make of Mauricio Lara? Because you can watch, as you know, you can watch as much tape as you as you physically can. It's different being that close to it and obviously seeing the fight take place without obviously over-divulging. We're, we're a week or so away from the rematch. What did you make of Lee's performance and Mauricio's? Like, I'll be honest. Like I think there was a lot of, if I'm being honest, a lot of in the build up like building Maurizio Lara up like he's this monster and this that and the other the fight went pretty much how I was expecting it to go up until that point and I think everybody that was like why would you pick Maurizio Lara was like actually a few people have said you know during the fight I was I was thinking actually I think Lee Wood's gonna pull this off and but we said all the way through the fight both guys are massive punchers anything can happen at any moment that could have happened either way at any moment in the fight Lee hit Lara with a few decent shots um, hurt him to the body at one point in the fight as well and I think it was consistently breaking him down with, with the jab to the body as well in the first fight I think that there wasn't much difference to, to, to what we expected to be honest the only thing I will say being honest is I thought that Lara would he had a lot more respect for Lee's power than I thought I didn't think he would make the adjustment of oof actually I can't afford to to rush in here because he is reckless and I kept saying that in the build up you know um, in the Mr Chaos lies opportunity but he was a lot less reckless than we'd seen him previously and I think that he has come on as well he's still young he's an improving fighter and I think he was slightly better in that sense in terms of transitions and not being as reckless as we expected however now he got what he was looking for in the first fight he may come out in this second fight thinking Do you know what I got what I wanted and I can afford to take a little bit more risk to to get there a little bit quicker which may lead to the first fight playing out a little bit more like the second fight playing out a little bit more how we anticipated the first fight so yeah but we'll, we'll see I had Lee ahead in the fight, which mm. I think the vast majority, if not everybody, did at the time. Uh, we spoke to Lee a short while ago, and he sort of said that, you know, he felt like he was, you know, forcing the fight and pressing the fight because there wasn't really much coming back. And he was kind of, he didn't say that he got careless or, or kind of anything like that. But for the rematch, does he have to be wary of not switching off? Because I don't think he made like a huge mistake with, with the shot. But is it, uh, you know, let's stay disciplined for 12 rounds or is it a case of, okay, look, I know those op openings are going to be there. I know he's going to respect my power. I'm going to go and stick it on him and, and get rid of him. Which way is it, it kind of likely to fall? Yeah, so as I was just saying there, I felt like Lara, I kept saying, in the midst of Cows lies opportunity. So there was a lot of talk about knockout, us knocking Maurizio Lara out. In the scenario of Lara closing the gap and rushing into Lee however I think once Lee started to exactly that started to find it a little bit easier to to land than what he had pre probably anticipated before getting in there and could see he was physically starting to break Maurizio Lara up the scenario of looking for a knockout become very different Lee all of a sudden looking to be the one to lead and, and close the gap and get a little bit carried away um, with the consistency of letting his hands go which ended up creating a scenario that uh, Lara ended up looking for and getting but you know a, a knockout can come in many different ways obviously so I think that it is important that even if Lee is breaking Maurizio Lara up that he's disciplined in a sense that I'm looking for a knockout I'm going for a knockout but not in the manner of in which I'm getting carried away and getting a little bit excited and leaving as much opportunities for Maurizio Lara to get off what he's looking for. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention to you about, and something that Lee mentioned in the interview that we we just did, was about the turnaround between the fight. And, you know, there was the the looming threat, should we say, of Mauricio Lara versus Josh Warrington 3, which is a fight that was discussed. I mean, even recently, Josh Warrington and Sean O'Hagan have kind of come out and spoke about that. Is this an ideal turnaround time? Does it not really matter did, for you? What did they say about it? What did they, uh, Sean and Josh, they said that they were promised the fight. They were told that they would get the Mauricio Lara fight. And then, of course, as it transpired, Lee Wood has got the uh, has got his rematch. Was there ever a kind of a scenario? I mean, Lee said, look, look, I always wanted this fight. It was the fight I wanted next. And I dug my heels in. But from your perspective, was it kind of, was it ever a, a potential for it not to happen? And is this the ideal turnaround time for it to happen? Yeah, so there was an opportunity for 
the allow Maurizio Lara and Josh Warrington fight to take place first, which was something that I was open to. Um, however, you know, instantly Lee was like, I, I, you know, I, I want that fight back. I, I want to run that back ASAP, which I wasn't against, but I wasn't against also, okay, let's let Maurizio Lara and Josh Warrington fight. We'll continue to work on what we need to work on and we will then fight the winner. However, the WBA then put out that they was going to call their mandatory of Kolmatov. And we was informed that, well, in that scenario, basically, I don't want to say too much, but in that scenario, Lee might not have been challenging for his own belt back if he was to get the rematch. And so that was important for Lee. That was something that Lee was was keen for I, I understand Lee was coming off of a TKO loss um, but it was sort of a single shot fight ending moment it wasn't like a sustained beating which often I feel is uh, can be a lot worse than, than a single shot uh, people have taken shots like that in sparring and then gone and fought a couple of weeks after Lee looks after himself consistently in the gym had a very short period out of the gym afterwards come back to the gym something that we took into consideration when um, planning ahead in the training camp um, however Lee wanted to fight not only fight Maurizio Lara but fight for the opportunity to win his belt back as well so with the situation that it occurred that it meant that, that the WBA potentially calling this mandatory Lee potentially losing that the rematch clause that he had contractually um, it meant that Lee wanted the immediate and the date was I think May the 20th we managed to get a push back to May the 27th which gave us an extra week but at the same time Lee is the type of fighter that he indulges so much into what we coach so much into a system and he's, he's we, the thing with Lee is where he's so coachable, you can almost mould him to, we want you to do more of this, we want you to do more of that, and sometimes a little bit too much. But I think that where, obviously there's some slight adjustments for this fight, but it's not going to be a complete, right, wipe the slate clean. It stands us in good stead in terms of preparation and planning for the rematch because fundamental parts of his game plan are already inbuilt in him and we're not then going away for another opponent completely wiping that slate clean to go away from it to come back to it so just positives and negatives but um, I'm confident that he's in a good place like I say he looks after himself slightly leaner it's a little bit of a smaller wake up for, for this one um, which has helped with, with a back to back training camps but like I say, he's a fighter that really does look after himself as well, if not better than any that I've ever worked with before. Have you noticed a, a, a difference in him? I spoke to you about the um, about the difference in him after particularly the condom fight and you just said, you know, there was no difference. If anything, he worked harder and became more of a consummate professional. I'd imagine there's probably been some sort of shift after that as well. Or is he kind of the same Lee? Is he is he hungrier now? Is it uh, How has he been since that? Because winning your first world title obviously is a, is a massive high. Losing it, no matter how you, you lost it, is, is obviously going to be a low. Yeah, I'm, I'm honest, sometimes a little bit too honest, but I feel like I'm way too obvious if I start to lie. So what I will say is when he come back, there was like, obviously there was this burning desire to get his title back, but he come back and just the intensity of everything was like through the roof. Yes, sounds great, sounds perfect, but can be a hindrance in other ways as well, like quickly burn yourself out and, and certain things like that. So hungrier than ever, hungrier than ever, but like almost this extra added intensity in certain things that he didn't need. So I think it's important that he's relaxed, doesn't put too much pressure on himself. Uh, just, again, doesn't let the emotions of what happened there, very clear-minded, um, just emotionless in a sense and focused to a point where it's great to be passionate and driven and he is all of those things but you don't want those things to override the most important thing is execution what do I need to do when I get in there 
and that's the most important thing so I think there was at some point in, in the training camp that we had the conversation of look relax we understand we can see we know that you're extremely motivated for this but maybe use that motivation to direct you a little bit more into execution what do I need to do planning as opposed to intensity how about yourself as a coach obviously you've had uh, you know, you've been around for a little while now um, you've had predominantly great success throughout your training career up to this point it's the first loss in a while for yourself and obviously in a world title fight how much do you learn about yourself as a trainer in moments like that do you kind of not put it to one side or put it behind you because I'm sure you want to learn from every experience good or bad but how does that help you develop and progress as a trainer um, proper gutting like obviously it was a sickener to be honest taking into consideration the fashion in which the, you know the fact that I had to stop the fight as well or decided to stop the fight a couple of times I parked outside the gym and was sitting there thinking you know was it the right decision should I have should I not have almost a guilt in terms of you know to, to having that responsibility but it's part of my job as well I don't question the decision but it's the the emotions that naturally come with it um but obviously as well like a, a burning desire to I want to put that right I feel like it's more than a winnable fight I feel like it's a fight that we should have won and that kills me um, I feel like I want it for Lee so much because I know how much he wants it but at the same time I'm big on I've got a lot of talented lads in the gym a lot of talented lads Lee is sort of the representation in a sense that you are all talented but will all of you achieve what I achieved even though know, a lot of them are more talented than Lee and Lee will openly say that himself in terms of pure talent but I've, I, it's like Lee is a representative of you do the right things consistently and work hard this is where you can get to. Imagine what some of those guys can get to. When those guys, I worked with Lee since, you know, when Lee come to me, unfortunately we had a short period of Lee's career. I would, if I had worked with Lee since from 18 years old, what I think we could have done with him would be pff, unbelievable. So Lee is a big example to the rest of the lads to say, I've been able to do this in a short space of time when I spent a big part but I worked hard and Billy Joe always used to say to me like that I remember like an 18 month two year period where Lee, Lee Wood didn't box but he was in the gym every day like he was boxing in a couple of weeks the fact that Lee's gone and won a, won a world title defended it you know achieved what he's achieved is I hold myself more proud of that than I do with training a talented lad that goes and puts on a performance or gets to an all right level or you know that leaves like my pride and joy in a way you know um, and I love using him as an example to the rest of them to say exactly what I just said there you know you've got all this talent in the world all this talent in the world if you don't achieve what he's achieved and more then that's because you've been outworked you've been outworked and to me that would be like to me, if if I was that boxer with a talent, that would be like a knife through the heart. I got outworked. Like I let someone else work harder than I did to achieve those things. Like that's that's the biggest. That would be the biggest killer for me if I was them. So, Lee's an example of that, and um, that's another reason why I want it just to stamp that, you know, that philosophy and that that belief into into the rest of the lads as well. Sticking with May the 27th and the featherweight division, but going over to Belfast for somebody that you know well in Michael Conlon, who challenges Luis Alberto Lopez for the IBF featherweight title. We saw Luis Alberto Lopez come over here and beat Josh Warrington in December. I know that you would have watched him previous to that against your Isaac Lowe's and um, Gabe Flores Jr., somebody that you'd have known through your, your kind of your gallivanting around the top-ranked gyms. Um, 
winnable fight, I feel, for Michael Conlon. I think it's a fight where stylistically it could favour him. How do you see it? Yeah, I think that it depends on how Mick approaches the fight because he's so versatile. He's got so many different styles, so to speak. I fancy Mick as a southpaw in this fight. I think that being a southpaw, the fact how he defends as a southpaw, I think will help take away the misdirection left hook that turns into a left hook to the body, that turns into a left hook to the head that can start like that and end up a left uppercut. I think it would help take that away. Um, and I think that Mick's very, very good up close. I think that that's a, that's a key part to his game. I think Mick's a good bluffer in a sense that in moments that he doesn't want to work, he's good at bluffing opponent, opponents to make it look like he does want to work. I think it's important in those moments when Lopez is inefficient, looking for a rest, Mick is able to not just bluff, but make him consistently work in those moments. Again, Mick's a very good body puncher. I think that, that could be key. Um, consistently going to the body in those moments to help take the wind out of Lopez um, but it's an intriguing fight but you know I I, I, I highly rate Mick Conlon um, to, uh, I really do fancy him in that fight I'm just trying to think who else is in the division Kolmatov is obviously mandatory you talk about champions the featherweight title is Navarrete. Navarrete is up at super featherweight now. Uh, Ray Vargas, isn't it, the other one? Yeah, because he's got. He went up to super featherweight to box Osharki Foster. He's on the way back down. I think Brandon Figueroa's got the interim, or he's got to fight for the interim. Uh, the WBO featherweight champion. We've got Ben, the cameraman here. I really do. You know, uh, Mickey's probably. Yeah, of course, Ramirez. Ramirez, Ramirez yeah, so, yeah, who had the win over Isaac Dogbert, yeah. Yeah, between Ramirez, a long day. Between Ramirez and, and Mick, they're the two most skillful. They're the two most technically sound, skillful fighters in, in the division. So, um, I do, I, I fancy Mick Conlon, but I don't think in a sense that a cakewalk, I think that a tough fight, but I think a fight that he can really show his class in as well. Last quick couple from me. Do appreciate your time at the end of a very busy day. Um, well, certainly for me. I mean, you're probably going to carry on working after this. But um, Josh Taylor, a few mm -hmm. weeks away from Josh Taylor versus Tiafimo Lopez. I've kind of mentioned it when I'm speaking to other guys from the gym. You know, an amicable split, which is something that we don't always see in boxing, as you well know. Um, but five or so, no, it's not. It's three or four weeks away. I'm losing, losing track of time at the minute from his bout with Tiafimo Lopez. Three weeks in it, I think. How does he get on in New York? Do you I like the fight for him? Yeah, I fancy Josh Taylor. I fancy Josh Taylor by stoppage, if I'm honest. I think that he is far too physical for Tiafimo Lopez. Josh is a phenomenal fighter, up close. Unless... I'm not going to say that, actually. Um, I think that Tiafimo will really struggle to hold Josh Taylor off and up close there's not many fighters that will match Josh in terms of volume engine size physicality I think that Ramirez is probably the only guy that would could match Josh in a fight like that I think that somebody that's coming up from lightweight like Teofimo Lopez um I just I, I can't see him holding Josh Taylor off and I see the fight going down that way down that path and uh, you know uh, uh, there's not many people in the world in and around not just in one four, the 140 pound division but in and around that division getting the better of Josh Taylor in a fight like that He's obviously training now up in Liverpool with Joe McNally, Declan O'Rourke, um, kind of quotes that from him in the last week or two. So back to his old self, which I don't take as any kind of dig at you, and I'm sure you don't either. What was it, do you think, that potentially wasn't the right fit between yourself and Josh? And what do you think we'll see from him in that fight if he is going back to quote-unquote his old self? Yeah, I don't think it's that. I think, I, I wouldn't say it's a case of, I wouldn't say it's a case of didn't fit. I would say that, and Josh will openly say this, and he openly said this, you know, to us at one point after the Jack fight is he just he likes to focus on himself. 
Whereas our approach is a lot to focus on what do you need to do to in relation to the opponent what's the opponent's strengths and weaknesses what's your strengths and weaknesses what do we need to avoid what scenarios do we want to create what scenarios do we want to avoid that is more so our approach whereas Josh he, he likes to focus on myself this is what I you know want to do and how I feel a lot of feel stuff he'll say a lot a lot of when he's training he'll talk a lot about how he feels um And, you know, I think that Jack stylistically is a tough fight. It is, like, just that Jack is a tough fight stylistically. People talk about levels. It's not levels. Like, people have spars, yeah? People have spars and have a hard spar with someone and go, like, I'm supposed to be able to batter him or whatever. Styles, bad style. Gonna have a t- You're having a tough time, bad style matchup for you. Um... I'm not saying that was the case with Josh, but I'm saying that Jack is one of those. Like that's that's the sparring situation. Just an example of levels don't often mean anything. That's why you'll often see fighters or, or trainers turn down certain fights, and you think and people. The quote that people always say: "If you can't beat him, it's not about if I can't beat him. It's about am I going to look good against somebody like that? Is that going to do me any good? Because stylistically, it's a bad matchup. You have that in boxing." Um, again, styles make fights. So I think that Jack was a tough style matchup. I think that Josh was exceptional against Ramirez, you know, a little bit away from the pressure fighter approach that people would label him for that fight. Because exactly that, what I was saying earlier about Ramirez being the type of guy that could probably match Josh in that that type of fight that we was talking about earlier. So... Um, but Josh again is a is a well rounded fighter, brilliant counter puncher, brilliant counter puncher, um, and a phenomenal inside fighter. So you know, you have to look at the opponent. that's our approach, sorry. Not you have to, but our approach is to look at the opponent and that's his strengths, that's his weaknesses, that's your strengths, that's your weaknesses. I don't I don't like that scenario in your favour. However, I like that scenario in your favour. And um as I said, Josh is a lot about how he feels and he'll openly say that and I've you know I openly find that everybody's individual and, and, and all the rest of it so uh, I like Josh as I said all along I've got nothing against Josh not a bad word to say about him he's a nice lad with, with a good family all the lads really like him you know that that's it really a lot of the fallouts with with, with people his egos and statements get made and then he said this and she said that like uh, there's just no need to get involved in all that I haven't ever with any fighter that I've you know I get on very well with Tyson I get on very well with Billy Joe I get on very well with 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 Josh so there is uh, none of that mentioned there about Billy Joe I was a a pleasure to see him today actually that's the first time I've seen him since before the pandemic I think so. He came up to me. He rubbed my belly and he said, "God, I thought I put on some weight," which I thought was, which I thought a was nice great. Nice welcome in. Yeah, no, it's what, what would you expect? It's Billy Joe Saunders. Um, I kind of, sp- I was saying to him, I check in with you maybe once every six months or so, and we hear something on the grapevine about Billy Joe and ask when he's going to come back. Are we, are we going to get Saunders 2.0? Is he? Is that a realistic thing? I mean, he's talking about he wants to come back in the ring, but it's been a couple of years now since the since the Canelo Alvarez fight. Do you think we see him back in the ring at some point? I think so, yeah. I think that often, not saying this with everybody that ever makes a comeback, but I think a lot of the time what we see people make comebacks for is a financial gain and a financial situation. Billy Joe isn't in that situation. It's just not like I need a box to get some money. So he's working to a time frame, so to speak. However, I think that he's boxing because he wants to box. A big part of that is being in the gym and being in the environment and just enjoying every single day. And that's something that I really do try, try to stress to the to the other fighters that are coming through. That like it's such a it's almost a fashionable thing to say. Oh, I hate boxing and oh, and it's hard work and it's this and it's that. And why do these fighters always want to come back? Why do people always want to come back into the gym when 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 they're done? Like they're the best days of your life, and you really need to appreciate it and enjoy it and make the most of it because you really will kick yourself if you let it go 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 by. And you need to make the most of it. In a bit. See you in a bit, mate.
you need to make the most of, uh, of these and it's something that I really do try to stress to all these lads because I've got lads at different stages I've got Royston who I've been working with since he was 17 he's now 19 a lawyer's just turned 20 I've got Pat and Luke who are 27 long time uh, amateurs you know Luke hopefully some new soon Pat I think four or five fights in um, they're all at different stages and you know Shabazz Lee McGregor almost experienced pros at their age you know at their young age and you really have to make the most of it because you you, you only get one career and it's so easy to keep saying this and people go yep 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 you're only really that only sinks in once it's done once it's gone as the saying goes youth is wasted on the young you can only you know I try my hardest to try and express, push this point to really drill it in that look you people say you learn from your experiences well smart people learn from other people's experiences when you come across these pros and this is what's made me come on to this point with somebody like Billy Joe when you come across these experienced pros that have been there seen it done it and they're telling you like you know I'm coming back because I love it and this that and the other and you you know you'll never beat the time that you're, you're the time that you're in now and the time that you've the position that you're in now you'll never experiences again and you really got to capitalize on it the smart people will take that on board and and take that into consideration and and try to maximize every single day that they've got and i think billy joe did that i think billy joe did that for as much as a reputation or what's the word i'm looking for where people have a the perception that people have of billy joe he was one of the hardest, if not the hardest trainer when it comes to working in the gym that I've worked with. That's why he was able to achieve the things that he's achieved. And he is good to have in the gym because he can help share those experiences with the rest of the lads. Now, it's only up to them if they want to listen. Nobody can force him to listen and to take that information on board. But... You know the fact that you've got somebody else trying to beat from the same drum, so to speak, is a, is a positive in my in my eyes, in my opinion. So it's great to have him in the gym. Be phenomenal to see him box again. I think that he's one of the mavericks of the this this generation of boxing, and I think that a lot of people would like to see him box again. Kind of, so you alluded to it a little bit there with regards to sort of Lee as somebody who squeezed everything out of his career and wasn't maybe the most talented. I think even though Billy Joe, two weight world champion, Olympian, box Canelo Alvarez, there is this perception that he underachieved and maybe could have done more as a pro. Do you agree with that? Yeah. You know, as insulting as that might sound, and I hate to say that, I think that so there's this fine line and fine balance isn't there between are you happy with what you've done are you happy deep down Cause, because if you ask anybody they go yep I'm happy I'm happy I've done this and I'm happy with that but deep down is there a little bit of an itch inside of you to say if I didn't do this 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 and this maybe I could have done that and I think there would be that little bit of an itch with Billy Joe if I'm being honest as mad as that might sound being a two weight world champion it just goes to show how good he is um, I think that he probably sat by himself would say that to himself but to other people he'd probably say no I'm happy which I think he is happy with his career I don't think that he sits there you know depressed about certain things and decisions and all this that he might have made throughout his career because like I say as much as his perception that people have got he was very dedicated he was trained really hard and um, but I just think that a little bit more focus on certain other areas around training not not in the gym but a little bit of a different approach to things making way and, and certain things like that he may you may squeeze a little bit more out of him okay right before I let you go I'm just going to run through a few quick bits on this weekend uh, first and foremost over to Las Vegas somebody you know very well Devin Haney defends his undisputed lightweight titles against somebody who I know that you have been a keen admirer of as I think any 
boxing fan has been Vasily Lomachenko, uh, the great Ukrainian three-rate world champion. Great fight. I know that you'll be up watching it. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, you, of course, have a... Will you be having a pizza? Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've completely fallen off. Of, I was, do you know what? I did really well. I was on a diet for about... It's not a long time. I was on a diet for about seven weeks. And then we announced Boxing Not News. Bad. And then after that, I was like, oh, okay. So it's just like the re- the relief of that. I'll get back on it soon. But anyway, back to the fight. Good fight. Brilliant fight. Who wins it? Uh, I fancy Devin. I do fancy Devin. Obviously, we've, we've done bits of work with Evan for the fight. Um, remotely, of course. I think that there's some key things for Devin that he needs to get done and do the early part of the fight and consistently throughout the fight I think again you know we talk a lot about scenarios and that's something when I when I work with Devin and talk to Devin he'll say you know whenever he talks to Floyd Floyd will always say the same situations that's that's what he coaches Floyd will coach situations and we'll, we'll say scenarios I think that that's where you win and lose fights certain scenarios can you nullify the opponent in a scenario that favours the opponent can you capitalise on a scenario that favours you um how many scenarios can you create that favour you and how many can you avoid that, that favour the opponent so certain scenarios that that favour Lomachenko certain scenarios that favour Devin and Devin's aware of them it's about being switched on consistent and um, maintaining the right approach but I think it's a winnable fight the Lomachenko is still in that pound for pound list for me for sure and Devin is the undisputed lightweight champion one of the best divisions in world boxing if not the best at the moment so I think that um, it's a real statement a real statement fight I know that probably technicality by numbers Tank and Ryan is probably a bigger fight in terms of pure numbers but I think from a boxing purist's standpoint this is the bigger fight for sure yeah, agreed. This is um that was bragging rights, quite a lot of bragging rights in Davis Garcia, and this is the one. This is one for all the marbles at lightweight. Um, how important is it? I mean, we, uh, people are talking about you know the size difference and the youth advantage that Devin has. We know he's a big boy at lightweight. He's been saying to, I mean, I interviewed him three years ago, and he said that he was looking at moving up. Mm. That's a long time, particularly mm. as a young guy who's growing into the weight. How important is it that he can? make his kind of youth and his size and his reach of course got that lovely jab work for him but also for Lomachenko we've seen Lomachenko struggle with guys like Lopez like Salido like Linares who can kind of hold the middle of the ring and try and push him back does Devin Haney have to do that in this fight does he have to push Lomachenko back in your opinion um again obviously having been doing work with Devin I don't want to say too much I think it'd be unfair um one of the points size I think a lot there's a lot of this talk about size I would use the word length more than size because I think that Lomachenko is brilliant in the clinch as we know I think that certainly it's an area that Devin needs to be switched on and and there's been a bit of focus on for sure you're a dirty fighter Lomachenko we've seen that stuff from Hayes is that gamesmanship I think that um it's a fine line, isn't it? I think that he works on the border. Some would say crosses the line. I think some would say, well, the ref said this type type thing. So I think he works along that line, I would say, Lomachenko. Um, I think that it's a lot of length for Lomachenko to have to cover to close the gap if Devin's doing the right things. We've seen him be brought onto shots like against Linares before. But that's not something that should be the main focus at all for Devin. But uh, like I said, I don't, I don't want to go into things too much because I think that would be unfair. But um, yeah, there's there's certain things that he needs to get done in certain periods of the fight, I think, to, to maximise his, uh, his success. And your prediction for the fight? I think Devin on points, I think. Um, Yeah, I would say Devin on points. I think a stoppage. I think Lomachenko is a little bit long in the tooth. Well-rounded. Knows how to not survive, 
that'd be a disrespectful way of putting it. I think knows how to kill the clock in moments that he wants to kill the clock or try to. And then the last one from me, Katie Taylor versus Chantel Cameron this weekend. I'll be honest, I, I, I haven't seen bundles of both of them as, you know, probably going to get slated for that comment, but um, I haven't seen bundles of them. I've seen little bits of Katie Taylor. Seems very high tempo, fast paced. I would call inefficient if I'm being completely honest. Probably going to get some serious stick for, for that, but oh, Chantel, yeah, find something anyway, I think Chantel something. Cameron's bigger than Katie Taylor. Is it one weight class? 140, yeah. So it's up at 140. Um, is Cameron big for 140? She's a good size 140. She boxed at lightweight earlier in her career, but she's now filled into the weight. And I think she's quite strong. I, I can see Katie Taylor having a strong first half, potentially a strong second half from Chantel Cameron. But again, I would say that my very small analysis on that fight isn't worth much cop because I haven't seen bundles of either of them, if I'm being honest. Honesty is the best policy. Absolutely. Uh, and with that, we'll leave it there. Um, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for having us down here in Harlow. No problem. I mentioned to you off camera, I am planning very much on getting down to more gyms. Um, obviously not to work out myself, uh, but to come and speak to yourself and the fighters. So thanks very much for having us, speaking to Boxing News, and we'll catch up with you soon. No problem.